This podcast is sponsored by LearnAbletonOnline.com, a community of Ableton Live users connecting you to the pros to learn today's music production. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Ableton Live Music Producer Podcast. I am your host, Dan Giffen, and today we have an extremely special guest who took time out of his busy schedule to join us, and you might know him as Moldover. Uh, Matt Moldover is a super talented MIDI gear whiz and a very naturally talented musician of all sorts. Uh, he's worked with some incredible artists, such as the Black Eyed Peas. He's also worked with Grateful Dead's drummer with his live configuration. He's also worked with Bass Nectar, DJ Shadow, and so many other famous people that you probably already know or are already listening to. So without further ado, thank you, Matt, for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Dan. Yeah, man, this will be fun. You have your most recent EP called 4Track, so I just want to give that a shout out to anybody else. Um, and you can go and check out Matt's uh, music at moldover.com. I got to see you, Matt. The first time we met was through our friends at Ableton Live, and you came to Indianapolis where I'm the user group organizer for Ableton. And you came and did an awesome presentation. And I, I saw your live performance. You gave a demo. And I literally felt like I was watching a concert from a different planet. It was, am <laughs> it was amazing. Like, you had all these buttons customized on your guitar. And you're a phenomenal guitar player, by the way. And you're just shredding. And like you had a really cool setup with Ableton. Um, obviously, a lot of our listeners, maybe they just use Ableton for the studio or for live performance or both. But I think that there's very few people I've met who know Ableton as well as you do and who has a live setup like you do. So I'm super stoked that you're joining us today. Uh, I guess just share with our audience. I'd like to start out and just ask you about like how you got started with music, how you got started, maybe like playing guitar. What was your inspiration and just how you got raised into the whole music thing? Sure. Yeah, I. Uh... Got interested in music when I was pretty young. Um, not super seriously interested, but my mom was an amateur cellist, and we had an upright piano in the house and some older brothers who were playing guitar. So um, music was around when I was young. Yeah. Um, I got deeper into it when I was like a teenager, started playing in bands, started writing songs, um, kind of teaching myself really, really basic home recording stuff um using a four track cassette recorder that's why that recording's uh my latest recording is called four track actually because it kind of harkens back to the simple songwriting stuff that i was doing when i was a kid but yeah i got really serious when i uh uh went to music school i went to berkeley college of music for four years and studied electronic music and uh and arranging there and yeah. um that definitely was a big influence just getting like really deep into music tech and also into uh, composition and um, that's where I started performing and writing electronic music for the first time. Um, and it was at the end of that that I discovered Ableton Live. And that was like just when it was coming out. It was version one, literally. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. That's and it was a really simple tool at that time. But um, it had some amazing features that nothing else had. And the unique position that, you know, it was designed to um, be a music performance instrument and not one. I mean, there were other sort of like things like early propeller head stuff where they're emulating tb 303s and tr 808s and you know yeah uh, those early, classic sounds yeah native instrument stuff where they're like here's a b3 organ and here's a profit um yeah synthesizer you know but ableton was kind of like its own thing totally different totally sure. unique interface and it would just make uh sampled audio into your you know silly putty <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, so that's what led me eventually to like stop playing in bands and start um, just doing controllerism, live music performance um, by myself and uh, using Ableton and uh, MIDI controllers as my instrument of expression. No, that's really cool, man. Uh, you kind of were coined under the name the godfather of controllerism. Um, like, how did that kind of come about? I know that you are super well known for building custom MIDI controllers? Like, how did, did you just start like ripping stuff apart and hardwiring it one day? Like, how did that kind of get started? Yeah, there was kind of a breaking point, a hot moment like that. Um, it was because I was using off the shelf controllers, which like in the early 2000s, I have to say were kind of lame by my standards. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yep. Uh, Probably by more people's standards than just yours. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, uh, that's a very biased opinion, you know, um, <laughs> largely coming from the fact that I was a traditional musician and I'm used to something like a guitar in my hands, which has right. been evolving for hundreds of years and is an incredibly expressive and intuitive instrument. I mean, it takes a long time to learn as well, but there is nothing akin to that in the, the world of controllers, except these really, really expensive, crazy things like Hawken Continuum, you know, multi-touch instruments um, that I just couldn't afford as a, a burgeoning working musician. Um, sure. Yeah, like many of us, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a factor, right? Like what's accessible. Sure, like selling blood plasma to buy <laughs> to buy the next toy that you need that you really don't need but you think you do but then you buy it and you realize how how much it fulfills your life so you really do need it actually yeah you can always right. grow more blood right <laughs> it's true yeah exactly <laughs> but anyway yeah no that's that's great so that was a long time ago you've really evolved and you've really I, i'm sure like have done so many new things since then many times ago uh, i saw the other day that you had um this custom midi glove that you designed that um i saw a video of and it looked pretty crazy and you were doing some really cool effects with it do you want to kind of explain that a little bit i just thought that was super fascinating yeah that was actually that was a hacked thing like that that's what i started doing was hacking those off-the-shelf controllers like i mentioned um yeah. and that video you're referring to that's actually like a whole course that i made for ask video um, about using video game controllers uh, for music. Okay. So, yeah, you can check that out and ask video if you search for Moldover. But that was a whole uh, course I put together because I actually made this um, this pilot TV show for PBS on that same topic, like using video game controllers. And so I took things like Nintendo Wiimote and like a Dance Dance Revolution pad and a bunch of other things. And the one I was using in that video was this Nintendo Power Glove from the 80s, which was this like totally failed... Uh, controller that was not fun at all <laughs> to play That's with. That's awesome. But it looks it's great. It looks like you know the '80s version of the future, and uh, and uh, and it's kind of cool. It's got like bend sensors in the finger. It's it's there's yeah. like, other gloves like that out there, but. I don't think any of them look as cool as the power glove. So that's oh no, it looked awesome. That. Yeah, it, it kind of almost looked like one of those incredible Hulk gloves that you buy at like Walmart or something. <laughs> yeah, it was like, totally. but it was like all decked out like future Hulk meets Transformers technology. Like it was pretty cool. It looked awesome. Uh, do you have some favorite out of the box MIDI controllers? I know that you customize a lot of your own, but are there any MIDI controllers out there that you've just fallen in love with that are just basically off the shelf? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I don't know if I'd say fall in love, but the ones like in front of me here are ones that I'm still using. Uh, so like, I have a Novation Launchpad. I mean, Launchpad was kind of like yep. the easy version of the Mono, you know. Yep. But I have the really old school one. It's like it has no, it only has like one color to it. But yeah, I yeah, I have the Mini, which is like that too. It's just uh, mm -hmm. I think it's orange and green or whatever, or yeah. yellow and green. But um, yeah, I like that one. I have a Newmark Orbit. You ever play with the Orbit? I have not. No, it's just super cheap. Like I bought it for like fifty bucks, and it's uh, it's so functional. I basically use it as like a, a controller for my audio interface. You know, like you want to like switch, um, you know, switch speakers to your 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 B or like some to monitor. <laughs> That's awesome. I have like a studio monitor controller. It's like That's perfect. great. But it's so also you, so you customize it to do that. Then you just kind of <laughs> hacked it to be able to switch to different inputs or. Yeah, it was actually pretty easy. I have like an RME audio interface and they have all these MIDI features built in. So I just oh, nice. to kind of reprogram okay. it. But um, That's cool. Yeah, it's a super fun. It's got motion sensors and it looks like a video game controller. It's pretty kick-ass. And then That's the fun. only other controller on my desk right now is a, uh, a Linstrument. You've seen the Linstrument? I, you know, I've heard about that, but I haven't actually seen it. Yeah, it's like a it's you know it's like a rolly seaboard. It's one of these new uh MPE like oh, okay, yeah. multi touch expressive controllers. Yeah. And um these things are cool just because, you know, it's so much faster to like play some, you know, vibrato, pitch bend, wobbly, whatever. Right. Yeah, uh, for those listeners who aren't familiar with this, it's basically like a think of the rolly seaboard like a big piano without keys. It's all just touchpad. And you can you can go between like one note to the other through every semitone, just like very smooth with your finger. And I have had I have a, um, a pianist that I was collaborating with recently, 
and he's a phenomenal piano player, like classically trained since he could walk. And he bought a Rolly Seaboard and he had a really hard time playing it because it's just not like your traditional keys. There's so many like variables in the way you touch it and how it's sensitive. But it sounds super cool if you can play it, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're kind of like a totally new breed of instrument, which is yeah. part, for me is really exciting about them. But Absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. If you had to say like one of the craziest mini controllers you've ever developed or like some the most intense controller as far as like configuring, like what would that be and, and what did you use it for? Uh, wow. The most intense as far as configuring. I mean, I, I guess the hardest one, the most intense was probably the first, which was the Mojo. Um, that's the one that sort of sits in front of me when I'm performing. And that's the one that initially... Uh, like replaced the 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 modified controller that I used to use just to control Ableton. So it's it's basically like a made for Ableton um, controller, but essentially yeah. to do a lot of like really you know high speed improvisational mixing and playing effects, um, doing lots of tricks. I mean the whole design of it was based on like studying um, turntablist technique and looking at dub mixers and just anybody who was like you know, using technology as an instrument and then trying to come up with something like more ergonomic and something that tied closely into the way that I was using Ableton. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks like a mess of like knobs and faders and touch strips and buttons. And, sure. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure it's full of like happy accidents. You just kind of bang your head on it and you could probably come up with some cool results. I've done that with the push before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's a big part of it is just like making a, um, an ergonomic and and expressive interface and then and then just learning to play it like an instrument and and the sure. accents are part of what makes it fun absolutely man and i and music should be fun you know i really think that it yeah it's amazing today how many people can actually create music that couldn't before because maybe like yourself they didn't put a ton of time into learning guitar and like being what some people might like deem as a true musician or whatever but you know, it's amazing to me, I think, like through technology, especially with Ableton, how people, anybody can create music, you know, no matter what your background is, you know, if, even if you don't have music theory, like using the push too. Uh, we had a previous podcast interview with my friend Ben Spilker, and he was talking about how he used the push and, you know, he doesn't know how to play a traditional instrument like a keyboard or a guitar, but he can come up with some really cool music just playing around with like MIDI and giving him the tools to actually create whatever is in his head. So I think that's amazing, and and you're on an, you're on a whole completely different level where you've started out as a musician, and then now you can just take your music above and beyond what the average person can, even with technology, because of all the customization that you do with MIDI routing and your controllers that you're custom building. I think it's really really cool. I have a lot of respect for you for that. Thanks. No, I, I see it the way you do too. Like for me, it's like a whole kind of revolution or renaissance for. Um... I guess I don't know the right word for it, but like regular people music, you know, like making <laughs> right. it accessible, right. democratizing it, you know, sure. taking it out of the hands of people who've, you know, it's really uh, not everybody has the opportunity to spend thousands of hours in a practice room getting really awesome at a traditional instrument, studying classical music or jazz or something like that, you know, right. So, like I've always been interested in the kind of music that comes out of people that don't have those opportunities. And, um, that's, that's a little bit how I see myself. I mean, I got to go to music school and that was, you know, that was, that was awesome, but yeah. Um, oh yeah. But I, yeah, I, but I'm most inspired by, you know, music that comes out of, um, you know, people that are, you know, going through some kind of struggle that are inspired by something that are fighting something. And, uh, yeah. So for me, like, I just love it when, um, when the uh, opportunity to make music is democratized and accessible to as many people as possible. And for me, that's, that's the really exciting thing about where electronic music is right now. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. You know, like I know my mom has more than the average amount of patience that the average person has because uh, I played drums growing up. And so <laughs> it, it's a lot quieter when you're playing a MIDI controller than when you're banging around a, you know, an eight piece set in a basement when everybody's trying to sleep in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Parents buy your kids MIDI controllers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Really. You should trust me. I'm going to buy my kids MIDI controllers before their drum set. Uh, but yeah, so um, I know that we talked about Ableton Live. Um, I guess what's, in your opinion, one of some of the biggest benefits in using Live versus other software? Uh, well, it's still unique in that way that I said before that it was made to be like a live performance instrument. And uh, it's really like held true to that value. You know, I was 
um, kind of surprised, honestly, because I, I think the fact is that more, a lot more people use it for production, like in a studio environment at this point. Yeah. And that's because they've made, you know, such a slick interface and it's so stable and it's, you know, they don't try to add, add every feature they can think of, you know, they're really strategic about when and how, um, they add stuff to it, you know? So it's, right. it's still like, it, it's gotten really powerful and more complex, but it's still far easier to learn than something like pro tools or Cubase or whatever. So, yeah. um, yeah. And it's still stable and awesome as a live performance instrument. So I don't know. That's what I love about it. And then stuff I never saw coming, like when they did Max for Live, you know, and that suddenly it's like, oh, wow, like now I can, I can hack Ableton, you know? Like, exactly. It's a <laughs> whole new world. Yeah. That just opened all kinds of doors and, uh, and for, you know, gigs, like, like you mentioned, like working for DJ Shadow, like I'm somebody that could say like, oh yeah, well you want to use like an off the shelf controller, uh, like an APC. That's great. That's, that's, a good choice because if it breaks or whatever you just go you know you have a second one um but yeah. you can customize the lights on it you can have it do you know some weird macro thing like max is such a um a useful thing to have integrated with ableton and now it's absolutely yeah now it's so stable and like um and now it's a standard thing it's not even like you know an upgrade i think it's in uh it's like standard with the new version of 10 is that right yeah yeah i think in nine suite or i'm sorry 10 suite yeah in 10 suite you uh i think it's bundled in there oh right it's in suite but now it doesn't like it doesn't have that boot up screen it's like it's oh not, right exactly yeah they exactly. built the engine into ableton or something like that i don't know but anyways and no and i i, I to add to all of what you just said i think it's really cool how open sourced max for live has become for musicians because i think it that alone builds a lot of community and opportunities for people to really get themselves out there as artists. You know, like for somebody to create their own Max for Live patch or device that they can share with the rest of the world of Ableton users, you know, I think it's a really cool way to kind of share things that you're creating to help other musicians do something in a really specific way that's going to be creative and expand what they can do as well. So I just think it's a really cool, like, open source network through max for live that all these musicians can come together around and share like different creative outlets of what they're creating to help other people create. I don't know. It's, it's cool. I just love, that's one thing I love about Ableton. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, as a platform for creative collaboration, like in totally new ways. That's it's brilliant. Ben Casey, who's the Ableton territory manager of, the East Coast um, of the U.S. He he said that he describes Max for Live as digital duct tape, and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> He's like, it really kind of is. It's like you're just fixing whatever it is that you want to fix with some duct tape with Max for Live. Uh, but yeah, so in your opinion, uh, with the new release of Ten, what are some of your favorite new updates that came out of that? Uh, well, it's for me, it's not the most exciting, but the most. Uh... The one that I enjoy the most is like the long list of uh, updates and changes to the arrangement view. Um, yes. Because to be honest, like I, um, like at the beginning of of production work on my last album, four track, like I sat down and like I, I did a whole song from start to finish in Ableton, like production wise, and it was like frustrating. Like there's a lot of like uh, little tricks, you know, in uh, in my other piece of production software, Cubase, that like. Um, I've just gotten used to like all these little shortcuts and yeah. implemented to make your workflow smoother when you're, you know, like art editing, you know, three different vocal tracks, like comping vocals or you're taking drums and you're doing timing correction or something like that. Um, just all this editing stuff. And um, with 10, with Ableton 10, like they've implemented like tons of that kind of stuff. So like automation stuff um mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of shortcut modifier things like you hold down command and now all the zooming works in a different way yeah um, i love that yeah logic did something very similar to that and i came from logic and so i was really happy because i got used to using that function as well with zooming in and out with command and yeah totally agree but yeah. the automation thing like you mentioned i felt like automation got a huge upgrade all you have to just do is double click now and the dots snap in on the automation curves that you're creating and I, that's another thing i really love so in the automation window as well with like the shortcut a like you're right there's so many little things that i'm like still discovering yeah so yeah it's not like a whiz bang <laughs> cool looking thing or whatever but like that it just made like editing 
in the arrangement view like a pleasure instead of like you know kind of annoying because i'm i'm used to some <laughs> other environment right uh, so i don't know so yeah like i'm i'm working on like a, a mixtape in in 10 uh all using the arrangement view and it's like yeah this is great i love this um, for sure. I don't know. So yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. And then I guess I really just dig the new devices like Echo and um, and the drum bus thing, which I haven't even dug into mm -hmm. too deeply. Um, but uh, yeah, having having like a space Echo kind of thing has has been one thing that I've wanted for a long time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That sounds phenomenal. Yeah, I don't know, but there's loads of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm 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 getting ready to switch uh, my live set over from nine to ten now and. Okay, um, that, that's when I can really dig in and start, you know, implementing all the, all the new, new tricks in my yep. uh, in my performance, which is where I spend most of my time with Ableton. Yeah, lots of fun shiny toys. Uh, <laughs> you you mentioned your uh, live performance with Ableton. Could you, to the best that you can over the phone, describe your live performance setup? What your setup looks like in Ableton and with the hardware that you're using and your guitar and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, it's pretty, I think conceptually, it's pretty simple. So in my mind, I've got like three instruments. There's uh, the Robocaster, which is like my augmented guitar. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a regular electric guitar, but it's got a MIDI controller built into it. And I use that to control the guitar effects. So yes. I love that thing, man. I was I was hearing all kinds of cool effects and tones coming out of that thing that I didn't know ever existed on a guitar before. It was it was really cool to see you demonstrate when you're here in indie. That was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's super fun. I mean, it's like it's like being able to play your effects with your hands on a guitar, which is something that just not really been explored. So that's right. fun, and that's straightforward. That's like a MIDI track for the MIDI and an audio track for the guitar audio, and um, just hook them up and then have a ridiculously complex chain of effects. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and it's the same thing on my microphone. So I have this new controller I'm, I'm still developing called the, the MC1, which is an augmented microphone controller. Same deal, it gives me the buttons and a joystick and motion sensors um, that attach to the mic. And similarly, like just process the, the <laughs> microphone audio. So it's like playing my vocal effects uh, right from the microphone. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. And then there's the Mojo, which is like, that's the complicated thing in Ableton. So the Mojo is, it's like, a, it's a combination of like a mixer and uh, just a whole ton of effects and then some like global controls for Ableton. So mostly it's like, a, it's, Very like cool. it's really just like a four channel, five channel mixer, um, lots of effects on each individual channel and then a whole bunch of different master effects and then a bunch of tricky stuff with Max for Live. So like... I have like a max patch for like surfing through this enormous um, session that I have in session view, like organizing my sets and uh, a bunch of other max patches for like, um, what do I like quantization control and just, just weird little okay. duct tape type things, digital duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. More duct tape. But yeah, it's, it's basically just, it plays back four tracks and then I, put effects on them. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, could you name drop a couple of those Max for Live uh, devices that you use? Yeah, well, the one I made public is is the one that I think is really useful, which is called Setlist Fire. And you can search for that. And um, okay. That's cool because it um, it lets you like sort of designate uh, songs. You can kind of attach songs to scene numbers and then make a set list and a text file. So when I'm like preparing for a show, like I just edit this little text file, which has, it's basically just a list of songs and then the scene number that they start on. And that way I just rearrange that file and it's equivalent to like, if you were in a band and you were like, you know, writing a set list on paper before a show. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little, you know, it's a max bash. It's like duct tape, but it's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I brilliant. I found it really useful just like because then I can think about organizing a set in a more organic way instead of trying to like drag scenes up and down in session sure. two or like yeah I, I don't know the other ways to do it. But especially in a huge set, even if you're DJing, I would imagine if you're just doing like traditional DJing and you have like you know like dozens of songs, that probably makes it a way easier to jump between. Oh wow! Yeah, I never even tried to use it with my DJ thing but you just gave me a great idea thank you <laughs> well, you're welcome there you go yeah it's my one tip for you today uh, but yeah no, that's really cool so yeah you talked about um you have your uh, modified guitar your microphone um and are there like what other midi 
uh, instruments do you use uh, in Ableton? Is is that pretty much it? Like, what else? That's the whole uh, like performance rig. I try to keep it as yeah. simple as that. Um, okay. Uh, in the studio, you know, like I said, I have the launch pad and the the instrument and the this little Numark Orbit, and that's you know just give me a note input for synthesizers and control the studio and control Ableton a little more, bit more. Yeah. Finesse wise, um, I should have a push. Um, not just saying that because it's an Ableton podcast, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> I never like I, I never got a push two, and push two was was like the one that was like everything I didn't like about my push one. I was like, oh damn, you fixed everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. It's a completely different controller. It really is. Yeah, uh, from the the push one is not the same controller as the push two at all. It, no. it's, it's so different. Yeah, I mean, my complaints were like, oh, it's like hard to control VSTs, and like the, the display is like a little bit limiting. And now the display is. is awesome, and you can it is. do VST stuff, and there's like piles of other things it can do too. Absolutely, yeah, you can get way more surgical inside the brain of Ableton with that thing. Yeah, it's awesome. I know. And so, yeah, you're reminding me of things I, things I want. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah. It's, we don't have the cheapest hobby. That is true. I mean, there's always <laughs> something new to buy. That's for sure. You know, for somebody who maybe is pretty new to the whole MIDI controller world, uh, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who was just wanting to start to get into customizing, say maybe some of their own MIDI controllers? Wow. I guess, I guess I'd say try to get like an old controller and just, go bananas like open it up because i mean that just opened so many uh doors for me is when i when i uh i mean for me it was like a nice you know kind of expensive controller at the time but you know the first thing i really opened up was uh actually no no the first thing i opened up was a m audio oxygen 8 is like one of the first cheap two octave midi control oh yeah yeah i know exactly what that is i mean you can buy this stuff people will give you this stuff for free because it's so old now um sure or you could buy just... it used or you know, that's part of why I made the gaming controller course uh, for Ask Audio is because, like, one of the things about those controllers is they're just, like, they're made by the millions, you know? You can get a Wiimote for, yeah. like, 10 bucks or something, and that's got motion exactly. sensors and buttons and, um, yeah. So, yeah, I just say, like, get something cheap and just take the whole thing apart. And if nothing else, like, you'll just get a sense for, like, oh, like, I'm not going to break it just by, like, taking the screws out and, like, oh, look, this is, like... It's just a little piece of plastic, like a button, is <laughs> the simplest thing there is in any controller. And, you know, when you right. realize it's just two pieces of metal making contact and, you know, usually something on, on top of it to make it a little easier to interact with with your hands. And suddenly, I don't know, there's just, in my mind, there were all these things that clicked of like, oh, I could make that different or better, or, you know, right. whatever. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, I even love that uh, your EP called Ford Track, you actually uh, designed it into a circuitry board, which I think is really cool. Like, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's pretty geeky stuff. So if you want to encourage people to get, get into well, yeah. it, uh, <laughs> right. I, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, so I uh, for my first uh, full-length album release, I just want to do some crazy artwork. Uh, cause I love, you know, like LP covers, this big 12 inch, you know, piece of visual artwork. And I love, you know, I just, I don't know. I love artwork of all kinds and, um, yeah. And I'm building instruments. So I was like, Hey, maybe I could build an instrument into the actual like album artwork, like the physical thing. So I made CDs and I built this, um, circuit board mounted, um, instrument called a light theremin, um, with my friend Jojo. And he taught me how to like lay out circuit boards and, um, and deal with uh, schematics and um yeah and so the first album was like a light theremin inside of a cd case and the new album four track uh it looks like a cassette just because i wanted to make it look kind of like a musical artifact <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's actually awesome. a usb drive and then it's also got the circuitry for um like a processor i call a voice crusher so it's got a microphone too um but you can plug anything into it and crush it it's just like destroys it and turns it into like noisy 8-bit um pitch shifted madness <laughs> that's yeah that's that's really cool man that's that's crazy yeah i don't think i've ever seen anything like that from any artist 
that that like far surpasses like handing out CDs or like here's a sticker. It's like I guarantee you probably one of the only people that's ever made something like that to be able to hand to people and make it, you know, like as a USB just to plug in. It's super unique and that's that's one thing I love about your music. I think it's really unique altogether, even the sound of it, and it's really organic. Yeah, I, I would I would just like to encourage people to to chase those crazy ideas, you know, like because. I don't know. It takes loads of work. It's always more work than you think it'll be. But uh, I just see a lot of value in like, you know, coming up with crazy stuff and executing it. To me, that's like, you know, that's what art and creativity is about. And and yeah, uh, for me, it's been a great way to kind of find a unique voice and you know get attention for some crazy art and music that might not otherwise get that attention. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I I like to ask a lot of guests on this podcast is. Uh, is there any inspiring quote that you would like to share or something that you heard somebody else say that really inspired you? Yeah, I remember uh, you mentioned that. Okay, well, here's one I read today is that um, a lyricist for the Grateful Dead died last week. His name is John Barlow. And uh, in his obituary, his uh, his mom used to tell him, uh, anyone who's bored isn't paying close enough attention. Because, uh, yeah, I remember when I was like, bored as a kid and then somehow huh. when I got into music and you know, got really serious about a creative endeavor, you know, that all just disappeared. It was like, yeah, yeah how can you be bored when you could just, you know, make stuff? <laughs> no, that's true. That is, that's really good. You know, if you're bored, then do something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Or, or pay no, attention it's so to what's simple, but yet so deep as deep as you want that to go. That's, that's good. Your well, thank you. No, that, <laughs> that's great, man. That's great. Awesome. Well, I mean, th that was the majority of the questions uh, I wanted to uh, just address with you. And uh, thank you so much for like joining us today, man. This was great. It was good to catch up with you. Uh, last time I saw you, um, I was blown away with what you do for your live performance. It was completely next level. And I'm really excited to see can you continue to grow as an artist. Um, everybody listening right now, uh, you can go to moldover.com. Um, and you also have a Facebook and do you, you have Twitter and, uh, you're on Instagram, right? Yeah. Those are all the okay. hot ones for me. Yeah. So what's your handle? Is it just mold over? Uh, yeah, pretty yeah, at mold over, mold over at on mold Instagram. Over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody go check out mold over. Thanks again for joining us today. And, uh, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share? No, I just want to thank you for all the inspiration you've shared. I hope people are checking out your stuff too, because it's awesome. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, man. You I appreciate that. So we're going to be working on a website right now, uh, collaborating with a lot of talented people, um, teaching Ableton Live. So for those of you listening who maybe want to get into uh, music production or performance professionally or just getting started, learnabletononline.com is a website that we're developing right now. It should be launched in April of 2018 near the end of the month and we'll have several courses uh, one is on the push to controller um, one is an intro to Ableton Live uh, with video tutorials and a lot of content to basically help you start producing music in the ways that you want to so uh, you could check that out and subscribe to our newsletter if you go to learnabletononline.com and we're really stoked to have a lot of really talented instructors coming together to help you guys take your music to another level. And we'll have a lot of free blog content and other things that we'd like to send you. So once again, thank you, Matt. I appreciate you, man, for taking your time out of your busy schedule. Uh, everybody go to moldover.com. Check out Moldover on Twitter, Facebook, all those social places. And we will definitely have you back again sometime, hopefully. I uh, yeah, I would love that. Thank you again for the opportunity, Dan. Um yeah, it's been man. really fun catching up with you too. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, for sure, man. Anytime. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, take it easy. This podcast is sponsored by LearnAbletonOnline.com, a community of Ableton Live users connecting you to the pros to learn today's music production.